here in this text to lay aside every weight. A weight in this, te in this text is something that will hold you back from running. Paul said this, Let us lay aside every weight and the, sin which, which, and the sin that does so easily beset us. Sin is a weight and it will beset you if you do, if you do not repent of it. Some other weights, um, that there, there are other weights. Um, today, entertainment seems to be a major weight. Getting consumed in your job can be a weight. Get, getting consumed in music and putting it before God is a weight. And there are many others. Anything in this world that has your attention more than God is a weight. Mm -hmm. Even things that are not outright bad can be a weight. It is, it is a distraction and it will make it impossible for you to run to the prize that is set before us. Here is what is said about a man who does not cast off the weights even though he knows they are there. Mark 8:36 For what shall profit for what sh shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You will not be profited if you do not cast off every weight. Weights make you weary, but here's what happens when you cast them off. Isaiah 40 verse 29 through 31 He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. In laying, every, in laying aside every weight, we can run efficiently. So if there is anything that you see is holding you back from running and receiving from God, cast it off. But why is it so important to cast off these weights? As I said before, a weight is something that holds you back from running. Even in the world, you may, you may watch a race where all people are doing is running to get a prize. Have you ever seen a runner? Have you ever seen a runner in that kind of race running while holding 120 pounds in each hand? No, as a matter of fact, if you tried to do that, you wouldn't get anywhere. The point of us running is so that we may get to our destination. In other words, we don't run in place. We run to gain ground. We, we run to receive a prize, an incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 26. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I, there, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. It is hard to run with weights, and if the weights are heavy enough, it can be impossible for us to run. The weights of sin and distraction are far too heavy for us to run with. In fact, you cannot, you cannot run and remain weighted down by sin and distraction. Romans 6, verses 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The world will think you strange when you do not run with them. 1 Peter 4, verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. We are to run with endurance because we are children of God and we are made in the image of our Father in heaven. And if, and if we were to run for a while and then quit in the middle, then we are not at all glorifying to God. If we try to run half-heartedly, we will not get to the end of the race in the time that God has given us. So how do we run efficiently? We look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Without looking unto Christ, we cannot run the race that is set before us. Also remember that while you are running, you have people watching you, and more importantly, God is watching. You are a witness of God. People who see you running may want to run with you and follow Christ as well. I would encourage you to run in a way that you can have much joy on the day of Christ, knowing that you ran so that you may be with him for eternity. And cast off those weights and know that running the race is not a labor that is in vain. Philippians 2 verse 14 through 16. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. With so great 
a cloud of witnesses. They are those in Hebrews chapter 11. There are two things I think that we can take from our brethren in Hebrews chapter 11. And we are not limited to just what's said in Hebrews chapter 11. We have a fuller record, of course, in the scriptures of our brethren that are found in Hebrews chapter 11. But they are all giving us at least two witnesses in all of their runnings is this. They all finished their race. They all finished their race. These all died in faith. See? So we are encouraged by that, that at least this, a man who walks by faith will indeed finish his race. Will finish his race. You see, if we do not think that we can finish the race, we're certainly not going to start the race. See, if you asked me to run a Boston Marathon, <laughs> I wouldn't even start it because there's no way that I could possibly finish it. The brethren must be encouraged that they can finish their race, see? And when you look into Hebrews chapter 11, you find all kinds of brethren who had less than you have, and yet they finished their race. But now there's one other thing. We, not, we must not be naive about the race. Because I'm, I'm saying these things to bring us to this exhortation in Hebrews 12. All of these brethren passed through great difficulties in order to finish their race. All of them. Whether you're talking about Abel having to overcome Cain, he had to do that before he finished this race. Or you're talking about Abraham sojourning in a land as a stranger. So that's not something that's easy. But that had to be done for him to finish his race, see, and... And even things like Jacob leaning upon the top of his staff in this great time where the, where the outer man is perishing and yet he maintains great hope and finishes his race. See, we must not, by not be naive about the race. We will finish the race by faith, but we will have to pass through difficulty to do so. And so he says in Hebrews chapter 12, let us run with patience. Let us have hope that we can finish the race, but let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The NIV says, let us run with perseverance. Perseverance. Perseverance means steady and continued action or belief, usually over a long period, and especially despite difficulties or setbacks. That is to say, the exhortation before us is let us continue to run the race. That's the idea. Let us continue to run the race. See, all men began running when they, when, they, when they believed. They began running. I love to think about the beginnings of the brethren. See, the Thessalonians, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. They began running. See, they did that. And all men did this. The Galatians began running. Had a good start, and yet Paul had to say to them, you did run well. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth of the gospel? See? It's not hard to run, brother, than a 50-yard dash, but it is hard to run a marathon. I think some people look at this fight like it's a 50-yard dash, like it's going to be something real easy. See? Anybody can run a certain measure of distance. I, any, none of us would have difficulty running maybe a foot. But this race isn't short. It's not that kind of race. It's a marathon, which means there are things to continue in. That's the idea. There are things that we must continue in, okay? That's the idea of endurance, see? We want to keep running to the very end. That's the only way you can finish this race. I think of a number of things in the scriptures that have exhortations like this to continue, like let brotherly love continue. Let it continue. Or here's something that the Apostle Paul exhorted the Colossians with. He says, You that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, the burden of the exhortation is not just to begin, it's to continue is to continue, okay? There are a lot of people that began well, but not all men have finished well. Right. I think of Demas. Hmm? Demas got a good start, but he didn't finish well. I think it's been said here before, you know, when we come to the end of our race, the word is not going to be well run, it's going to be well done. Did you finish the race? If you began well, but you didn't finish, sorry, there's, there's no merit for that. Our text is to continue 
until you finish the race. Think of some of the exhortations in scripture that accentuate continuing like this one. You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, <laughs> then you receive the promise. See, and doing the will of God isn't always just like one little circumstance here and there today. Doing the will of God is like a life work. It's like a life work. It's like when Noah built the ark. I mean, that was like a life work. That wasn't like a short work. It wasn't something that he could do part-time. This had to be the thing he did. Amen. See, running the race is like this is our life ambition. This is our work is to run the race. Or how about this one? Seek those things which are above. Well, when do you not do that? You're running when you keep doing that. Some men have been knocked out of the race. They're not seeking these things anymore. Certainly you have, you have known men who have began running well. They were seeking the things that are above, but something turned them aside. They're not running with endurance. They're not continuing in the race. Or how about this one? Here's a one-word exhortation from Jesus. Watch. I mean, that isn't something we do just one time. This is something we always do, and particularly, brethren, because we are among those who are living in the end of the age. With Jesus' imminent return at hand, watch. There are some men who have quit watching, haven't they? Yeah. Been distracted. They've turned, turned aside by some kind of an earthly ambition. The lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and they quit watching. They're not running anymore. They've been knocked out. They're not enduring. Not enduring. How about this one? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Well, there, there's a life work for you. You don't have the whole of it yet, do you? You've got a first fruit. And you'll find as you grow, eternal life gets like bigger. You've got to have bigger hands to get a hold on it. See? Yeah. That's a life work. Amen. Lay hold on eternal life. <laughs> see, that's what I'm saying. Continuing has to do with <laughs> we're continuing in the things, brother, that God has directed us toward. That's our race. Let's continue in those things. Now, our course is not like that smooth course that's laid out like in the Olympics. It's not like that at all. Unfortunately, our course is more like an obstacle course. That's what it is. It's not some smooth track. It's like a difficult. There's like difficulty associated with our running. When we run along, we find that there are obstacles in the way. And you can't run around them. You got to stay on the course. And you got to run through them. you got to do like David said. You know, you've had days like this, and David had a number of days like this. He said, by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. He didn't run around the troop. He didn't run around the wall. you got to go through it. Amen. Now think, brother, and just think practically about the people of God. Think about this for a moment. Abel had to run through Cain to get home. To make the finish line, he had to do that. He had to do that. See? Enoch had to run through an entire ungodly generation while he was serving God in order to make it to the finish line. Hey? Jacob had to, so to speak, run through Laban. He had to run right through him. He couldn't be distracted by unfair treatment. By the way, if that word's in your vocabulary, get rid of it. Fair. I don't like that word. If it wasn't fair for Jesus, you should not cry out for it to be fair for you. And all the sins of the world were laid on him. He had to run through Laban. David had to run through Goliath. Daniel had to run through the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to run through the fiery furnace. See? You got to run through it. You can't run around it. If you get off the course, you're going to have to get back on where you got on. And if an yeah. obstacle's in front of you, now you got to confront it and run through it. You got to run through it, brethren. That's where the endurance is required. It's difficult. Jesus said it this way Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that enter thereat. Whenever you see a lot of professing Christians look for a convenient way to work out their own salvation, I think we've got a real problem. People do not understand the nature of this race. It is a race that requires endurance because it's difficult. It's difficult. Okay? That's what Jesus said. He went on to say, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be 
that find it. Whenever the Apostle Paul went back around the churches, he was wanting to confirm the churches and encourage them and strengthen them. Remember, he confirmed the souls of the disciples. And then he told them, but you must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. Brethren, are you sur- I know you're not, but let me just say this for sake of what Peter said. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. I thought I was a child of God. Why am I facing all these difficulties? Why am I facing imaginations? Why am I facing trouble? Why, does the, why doesn't the boss treat me right? Why, and this and this and this. Are you surprised that those things are happening? Why? Is not this a race that requires endurance to run? It does. It's a difficult race. Thankfully, that's not all I have to say tonight, but, but that we have to be confronted with the need for endurance. Mm-hmm. Bully, I like what Brother Gibbons said one time. He says, if it was easy for you, you wouldn't appreciate heaven when you got there anyways. Just think, oh, the only difficulty you're ever going to face is here. Yeah. Amen. There won't be any there. I thought that I was encouraging a sister on Facebook uh, yesterday, and I encouraged her with this. You know, after Jesus suffered and he went back to glory, he will never be required by God to suffer again. Yeah. Neither will you. But as it is stands now, you require endurance to run the race that is set before you. And so we want to, brethren, be practical about this. If it's going to be difficult, then I'm going to see to it that I scale down. I do not want to try and run a race that requires endurance with weight that is unnecessary. Let us lay aside not some weight, Every weight Amen. and the sin which does so easily beset us. There is enough, no, I don't call it weight, but there is enough difficulty associated with this, with this race than putting on yourself unnecessary yeah. encumbrances, which is what a weight is. Yeah. And by the way, let me say this while I forgot it. I didn't put this in my notes, but I've been thinking about this. You know, there is grace to cast off every weight, but there is not grace to run with weight. Hey, God, won't, God will give you grace to cast it off, but he will not give you grace to run with it. If you insist on going down the road of earthly ambition, you'll be knocked out of the race. It'll be too hard. You're encumbered about. You've got to get rid of the weights. If you insist on continually being anxious about things, when God has said, be anxious for nothing. Now, I understand the struggle with that. I understand that. But hey, that has to be cast off. Because there isn't grace to run being possessed with anxiousness. And, and on and on we could go. I'm not, I'm not here to try and develop a list of what weights are. We have got to learn to travel lightly. Because we are pilgrims on the move. Peter himself said, I beseech you as pilgrims and strangers, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. How do they war against the soul? They weigh you down. They weigh you down. We're on the move. You can't have weight. Look at the Israelites. What a marvelous picture of salvation. They got out of Egypt, but that wasn't the end of the work of salvation, was it, for them? Because God's intention was to get them into Canaan, and so they became a people on the move. God wisely provided lightness in their travel. He didn't let their clothes wear out. For one thing, in other words, they didn't have to bring a bunch of change of clothes. They while they were in the wilderness, you know, there wasn't a Walmart in the wilderness. He didn't let their clothes wear out. When he provided the tabernacle service, see, it wasn't, it wasn't Solomon's temple they built there in the wilderness, was it? Tabernacle could be broke down and carried because they were people on the move. But another thing God had provided that became a snare unto them was manna. Manna. And it wasn't too long where these fleshly Israelites began to complain about manna. Mm -hmm. And here's what they said in Numbers 21, 4 and 5. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spank against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Well, they wanted some flesh. You remember, I think Brother, Brother Given mentioned this, of that mixed multitude there, and I think it was Numbers 11. Yeah. 
that mixed multitude that talked about the great affair they had while they were in Egypt. And they actually provoked the Israelites to want flesh. God gave them quail, and while it was yet in their nostrils, he began to kill. Why? Because God has wisely provided a light meal for travelers. Amen. It was light bread. It was that. But that was by divine intention that it be light. Because if you're going to travel, you can't have extra weight. Now, let me tell you, brethren, this is the manner of the flesh to always want things that make for weight. Yeah. Yeah. It's the way it is. And if you spend much time around ungodly people, you better be careful because pretty soon they'll be making you want things that have to do with weight. We've got to. St I understand, brother, and I understand we're a light in the world, but you do not become unequally yoked with ungodly people because they have a desire to things that make for weight. God has wisely provided us the gospel. It makes for light eating, doesn't it? It's very deep, and his letters are very weighty, and yet it makes for light traveling, doesn't it? It does. We come out of the meeting, and we're like flying and running. What is that? It's light. See? It's light from a sense. I'm glad for that. Cast off every weight, and the sin which does oh so easily beset us see i think of the word that jesus said one time he says i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there you may also be now if we are not yet where he is then we're classified as pilgrims he has gone back to heaven, and we are making our trek there. And as long as we are not yet there, we are travelers and must travel lightly. But ultimately, brethren, it is who we are looking to that ultimately assists us in this rate. We, we can think of this cloud of witnesses and be encouraged by them. I have... We've thought a lot about these cloud of witnesses. Brother Given is ministering to us so effectively about this. I, I look at Brother, Brother Abraham, and I'm provoked by his faith. Brother Jason, that word you gave this morning was marvelous. I am provoked by his faith. I am provoked by Jacob and all the difficulties that he faced, and yet they weren't complainers. They trusted in living God, didn't get distracted, walked by faith, not by sight, and lived a simple life, not elementary life, but a life devoted singly to God. Uh, that's wonderful to consider. And we do want to consider the fact that the race, it's a real race and it's difficult. And just because you're God's child doesn't mean you don't face difficulty. And we want to be sober about that. But the thing ultimately that assists us to run with endurance the race is set before us is the one that we are looking to. The Son of God himself. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. For consider him, brethren, consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Think of this, brethren. It is what we look to by faith that makes us enduring in the race. This is the sense in which this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. It's what we see by faith. Until the race is worth it to go through any difficulty to get to the end of it, you're not going to run in it. What you see by faith makes it worth it. If Moses can, can be in Egypt and see him that is invisible, he'll endure. <coughs> he'll endure. He'll cast aside Egypt. You know, you've done that yourself. You've seen the invisible God, and he dwarfs everything. You cast it aside. It's not difficult. <laughs> cast it aside. See? If Isaiah can see him that is high and lifted up, he'll be able to be told by God, they're not going to listen to what you say, and he'll be able to say it anyway. That's the way it is. That's the way it is, brethren. It's what we see by faith, and pre preeminently the thing that we see by faith is what Brother Jason said this morning. The object of our faith is the Son of God himself. Amen. And so let me just labor on that point to finish, this, to finish up this sermon. Think about it this way. 
It was your perceptions of Jesus that got you into the race in the first place. It is your continuing looking to Jesus that will keep you in the race. I'll tell you, brethren, the knowledge of justification by faith, knowing of this Savior who bore our sin, knowing the, of the gift of eternal life that is found in Christ Jesus, knowing of the favor of God toward his son. All of these things were things that work in us, that brought us into the race. Okay? I know that we had an elementary view, but, brother, we don't forsake the things that we saw at first. We build on them. They expand in our own heart. I like that, uh, Col that Colossians exhortation that says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. See, we never forsake Christ for something else. It's not like that. We run continually looking to Jesus. So let me just give you some things to see in Jesus that will encourage our running. One is this, that Jesus is an all-sufficient, ever-present, and active Savior. He is the author and finisher of our faith. That's what we are first committed to in this text to look at. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay? There is no aspect of salvation that you are not called upon to enter into that Jesus does not equip you to do. Because if there was such a thing like that, then you would have something you could boast in. Even the things that he calls you to do, I know he won't do them for you. God is not going to mortify your members for you. But he is going to give you the resources to do it. Amen. Okay? To say that he is the author and finisher means that he is an ever-present help throughout the entire thing. He brought you into the race. He is going to enable you to finish the race. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. See? God does not begin something that you finish. Sorry, there's, there's nothing like that in salvation. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. I think this is one of the things that people don't seem to understand. Is it we that work or is it God that works? Yes. Both. 100%. Mixed into the work. As soon as you give 90, that's that. God's out. That's the way it is. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. See, it demands all of your effort. But all of your effort would mean nothing if it wasn't for his effort. He is the author and finisher of our faith. I love to think about that, brother. And you, when you think about the obligations to, want to run, be reminded of this. Jesus wants you to finish the race more than you do. All of the effort that has been put forth in the foundation of salvation, one of the including things is the death of Jesus Christ. Think of the sacrifice of Christ to bring you into the race. Certainly he would not leave you to the side. He won't do this. He'll be with you so that you can finish the race. The reason why people don't finish the race has nothing to do with the insufficiency of the Savior. Their lack of endurance is not owing to any lack of resources on Jesus' part. Something has turned their focus aside. That's why. You see, Jesus ministers to you as you are looking to him. That's the way it works. At one point in time, we are turned aside. I understand Jesus will labor to bring your focus back in. We see that in the personified in the Apostle Paul toward the Galatians and the Colossians. Jesus himself in the, in the churches in Revelation, to the Ephesians, Thyatira, Sardis, all these churches laboring to get their focus back on the Lord. Because when your eyes are on him, you will not fall. He is the author and finisher of our faith. But that's not the only thing he is to us, because he goes on. Jesus is a suffering savior. That's what he is. Consider him, what should we consider? Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Consider that aspect of Jesus. You see, Jesus, brethren, is the forerunner. In Hebrews, he's called the forerunner. 
which means he's run in this difficult race before you did. Mm -hmm. hmm? In fact, he said one time, he said, the world hates you. Mm -hmm. It hated me before it hated you. Okay? In fact, we are, brethren, what we are really fellowshipping in is the residue of Christ's sufferings. Mm -hmm. He bore the brunt of suffering. Mm -hmm. Your cross will never be as big as his. Amen. It will be your cross mm -hmm. that you are to take up daily. But know this, when you face suffering, know this, that Jesus himself is well acquainted with suffering. He's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Okay? He is that, and that he endured it. I love to think about it. I'll tell you, our, whenever we get caught up in our difficulties, it is good to consider others have suffered much more than we have, especially Jesus. I'll tell you what, I cannot look in the face of a suffering Savior who has brought to me so many marvelous liberties through that suffering and then say unto him, my sufferings are too great. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. He suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And you must know that his sufferings were purposeful sufferings. God will never, will never call upon you to endure sufferings that aren't purposeful as long as you're walking by faith. It's the way it is. He was made perfect. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. I suppose if anyone should have not had to suffer, it would have been the son. But he was the highly favored one, and he suffered. So consider, brethren, consider his sufferings and how he endured. Think of this, brethren, that he is an enduring and a triumphant savior. He passed through great difficulties, and yet he triumphed. That's the marvelous thing to behold, and I'm going to end with this thing. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. See? Jesus said one time, he says, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. And then he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's a marvelous thing to consider. I've overcome it. Notice he didn't say, be of good cheer, because you will overcome the world. You look to the fact that I have overcome the world, and then you will be able to overcome the world. Yeah. See, look, brethren, to where Jesus is. Look at where he was, and then look at where he is. Mm -hmm. Think of what Jesus passed through. Consider this, that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Think of that kind of suffering. Think of how difficult that has been. Some of you have done the same thing. You come unto your own, and you've had some of your own company, family members, that have not received you. They've turned aside. Well, Jesus faced... The, uh, that on a much greater scale. Most of the entire nation of Israel had rejected him. They brought him in the great triumphal entry into the city, and not a few days later, they were saying, crucify him. Came unto his own. His own received him not. Daily, Jesus was subject to all manner of reviling. All manner of it. Well, he's a wine-bibber. He's a gluttonous man. Look at all the eating they're doing. He's a gluttonous man. He casts out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. You think these things, these just bounced off Jesus? I'm not saying he went over in a corner and cried about it. It's not easy to face reviling. See? He faced these kind of things. He's us. We know he's a sinner. Now, you face similar things like this, but look to the Son of God. He faced these things. He didn't, he, he finished his race. Didn't get discouraged by this. See? He faced a number of difficulties especially that night. I'm reminded of that text in Hebrews says that he cried out to God with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. The thing that Jesus endured more than anything else is the thing that you won't have to endure, the cross of Christ. Think of the cross. Think of what was involved there that night when he was petitioning himself before God saying, nevertheless, not what I will, but thou wilt be done. Angels were beholding him, praying and laboring in prayer. An angel appeared unto him, strengthening him. 
so that he came into such a great intercession that drops of blood flowed down from him. That's suffering and difficulty. And then ultimately to have his father forsake him and turn his eyes from him, the sins of the world being laid upon him, that's suffering. Suffering that you will never face, but know this, Jesus faced it and he's at the right hand of the father. See? He made it home. You will be able to make it home too if you will continually look to the conquering Savior. Behold him there at the right hand where he is bringing us to and receive encouragement because when you look at the difficulties Jesus faced, they make your difficulties minimal, minimal and manageable. Amen. They do. Amen. They do. And he is the forerunner that is for us entered and he's going to see to it that we enter too. As we look unto him. Now I'm just going to conclude with this word. You know there are a number of ways. That we can approach the joy that was set before us. Because Jesus didn't just focus on the difficulties. He, he wasn't unaware of them. But there was an incentive that was moving him. Through the cross. And it was of course. Being back at the father's right hand. He told you that in John 17. That's my longing. This is my longing father. To have the glory I had with you. Before the world was. That's where I want to be. That was the chief joy of Jesus, is to be with his father. That was his chief joy. And now our chief joy is his chief joy as well. Our desire is to preeminently be with the father and to be with his son. And here's how, here's how the apostle Paul communicated it. He said, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Paul was so impacted by his understanding of Jesus that it made every difficulty he faced light in comparison. He referred to his afflictions as momentary and light afflictions. Yeah. When you look at what Paul faced, they weren't light in the flesh, but they were in the spirit. See, they were. It's because the excellency, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus and he said, this one thing I do, I'm going to forget the things that are behind and reach forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark. And what was the mark for Paul? To win Christ. That was the mark. To win Christ. Now, I think, brethren, that we do a great service when we stand here in this pulpit and we give a true understanding of who Jesus is. Because when a man walks by faith, the increase of his understanding of Jesus causes for his longing for Christ to be increased. That's what we do. That's one way we stir one another to love and good works is we preach Christ as we see him clearly. There's ample incentive to run with endurance the race that's set before you. Let me leave you with this song, and then Brother, Brother Gene will come up and give an exhortation. It is a song, Fight the Good Fight, because the thing that I love to see in here, and I'm glad my love for Jesus is increasing, my satisfaction increases in correspondence to my understanding of him. But Jesus isn't just the way to make it home. He's not just the means of running. He is the prize at the end of the race. That's what he is. And that's what this song highlights. It's called Fight the Good Fight. We've sung it here. It says, Fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. I like that. Lay hold on life, and that shall be thy joy and crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up thine eyes and seek his face. Life with its way before us lies. Christ is the path, and Christ the prize. Thank you, brethren.